Okay. Check, check. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're ready for the next presentation here in the demo theater. So uh, we'll start here in the next uh, half a minute or so. For those of you that are interested in object storage uh, in the OpenStack environment, please come in. Uh, please come and join us. Okay. So um, maybe a quick just show of hands from people. Who, who knows about object storage? A few of you? Okay. So what we're going to talk about here is uh, the need for big scale-out storage in the OpenStack environment. And I think most of you that have followed OpenStack know that uh, there are a variety of storage services for OpenStack, including an object storage service. It's called Swift. Uh, it's perfect for storing you know, big payload data, uh, potentially hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of storage. Uh, however, there is a trend in the market now that we need to take a look at, and that's the emergence of Amazon's S3 protocol as a uh, very powerful alternative for building this, this class of application and storing large-scale data. So that's what my talk is about here. Okay, so there's a few things we want to kind of chat about as a precursor to the actual capabilities of S3, and that is we're building these new data centers. They're centered around the cloud. Uh, we want a lot of flexibility and agility. What's the, the right way to build storage for these environments? So maybe just a couple of comments on that. Uh, there is also a trend certainly towards software, right? We all know that software is kind of the, the, the paradigm that's eating the world, so to speak. And that's true also in storage. So you'll, you'll hear the uh, term SDS, or Software Defined Storage, as the way to build these systems within the cloud. Um, and then we'll look take a quick look at how the evolution of object storage has happened in the last few years, Swift and S3, and that'll kind of be the heart of what we talk about is some of the advanced features that are available in either protocol. Okay, so uh, certainly those of us that are building clouds are aware of the fact that uh, this creates new challenges, right? We now have OpenStack as a common framework. Uh, of course, the goal intent of OpenStack is to uh, host applications, right? Without the applications and our end users, uh, there's really no point to all of this. Uh, the, the real thing that happens when you start creating cloud environments, though, is you create an environment where you get a lot of diversity in applications, in workloads. Uh, you have new challenges in managing your network and in managing the environment overall. Uh, but one of the problems that we're focused on is how do you manage all the storage that results from uh, a very dynamic and agile cloud environment? Uh, certainly, we've seen in the work that we've done with our customers that uh, there's a tendency to start provisioning lots and lots of different VMs, lots of workloads. Uh, that creates a storage management problem, right? You start having the need for scalable storage for the VMs themselves. Uh, you have file storage. You have object storage. Uh, the net net is there's just a huge and growing problem in managing all this. And moreover, if you're starting to manage things like images and videos and big archives and, and backups, you're pretty quickly going to see a problem where you have hundreds of terabytes or petabytes to manage. Uh, so that's the reason for the advent in uh, storage protocols like Swift within the OpenStack environment, uh, but also in uh, other protocols like Amazon's S3. Uh, so the key thing that we recognize here is that we need a very powerful and advanced set of functionality to deal with this type of data. Okay. Uh, so the model uh, for storing all this now is software. There's uh, a number of different approaches to the problem in the market, uh, but certainly distributed storage seems to be the model that everybody's embracing. So what does this mean? Uh, first, it means that uh, I need the ability to scale capacity as I see the requirements increase. So I may be starting with hundreds of terabytes, but I see the, the horizon coming into petabytes. So I want to be able to scale out the number of services that uh, applications can talk to. These may be object storage, file storage, block storage, uh, and certainly uh, a choice of different protocols, things like uh, Swift and Manila in the file, file world for, uh, for, for OpenStack. Uh, I also need the ability to scale out the capacity, so I want kind of multi-dimensional uh, services on all of that. But the heart of what I want in uh, software-defined storage is a set of intelligent services, kind of the control plane side of this. So I certainly want data protection at scale, and this is very different from what we did in the past with RAID-based systems, right, where we had maybe a few tens of disk drives to manage. Now we're talking about managing hundreds and thousands of disk drives. So uh, managing these things where I have replication, I have erasure coding, 
uh, but the system is managing the fact that components may be failing. And it just deals with that in the nor normal sort of cloud model where it routes around, routes around the failure conditions and can self-heal the, them. I want to be able to grow without disruption, right? If I add capacity or I add additional uh, services for storage, I want to do that without any service disruption. And then I, of course, want to reap the benefits of frequent, frequent advancements. So that's really one of the key advantages to decoupling this functionality in software. I don't want to be tied to the cycles of hardware-based appliances or arrays uh, to depend on new functionality coming my way. Okay, and the final thing we want is that we want to manage all this via common uh, frameworks. I do want to use OpenStack, uh, but I also want to manage things via Nagios and ma many other open source environments. So what that really means is that the system needs to export its monitoring and management uh, uh, capabilities via APIs, right? That's more important uh, from an orchestration and management perspective than having a closed uh, UI. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, then let's think a little bit about the different storage that you might see in OpenStack. You certainly see a range. So we see the need to store things like operating system images, uh, but I also have my application stacks, right? I have my, uh, my common stacks for databases and for other application components that I want to assemble together. Uh, but then beyond that, the capacity starts to grow, right? Document repositories, web servers, leading all the way up to the new media content that we see uh, with video and image data. Uh, I'm not sure if people have tracked uh, this, but uh, video data is getting huge, of course, with 4K. Uh, it can be tens of megabytes per frame now to store a 4K video. Uh, so imagine having to keep 24 frames per second online. Uh, you certainly quickly get into uh, the petabyte scale with that. So OpenStack does have solutions for all of this. Uh, certainly we uh, can put the high performance tier one uh, operating system stuff on flash or on local storage. I uh, have Glance. Uh, as a service within OpenStack to store my uh, images and keep a repository. And now I have a choice. I can use Cinder or I can use Manila uh, to create uh, shared file services. And then ultimately for the very big scale stuff, I do want to start taking a look at Swift and as an alternative, the S3 API. Uh, so there is interoperability now with S3 and Swift within OpenStack. Uh, so I think that becomes uh, a, an interesting decision uh, to think about whether we need the advanced services that are available to us in one of the protocols or not, or the other. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, how do we talk to object storage? Okay, so object storage, what is an object storage API? It's essentially a way, a simplified way to address storage through a key value store. I have a key, which is an idea of an object, and I have the payload, right? That's the value, and I want to map these two together. And essentially the application wants to be able to put uh, payloads and to get them through these handles. So in a very simple way of speaking, that's the idea. Uh, I also want to be able to associate metadata with the data, things like my attributes, like if I have a video file, who created it, uh, what's the author name, etc. cetera. Uh, but all of this gets presented as a flat namespace, right? There isn't the concept of folders and subfolders as we would have in a, in a traditional file system. So if you look back, this all started maybe 15 years ago. There was what people called uh, Object Storage 1.0, uh, and that really was the, the, the world of what people called Content Addressed Storage, or CAS. Uh, this really came about with products like uh, EMC Centera, which were purpose-built for storing data for a long period of time, immutable data. So uh, we would store an object, associate a, a, a CAS signature with it, but we never wanted to modify it. Okay, so that was a little bit of a vendor-specific or proprietary way of doing things. Uh, that emerged into kind of object storage 2.0 with a bunch more vendor-specific object storage APIs. Uh, so they came about from the big vendors and the little vendors, but notably this was also the time that Amazon S3 launched. So this was in the 2006, uh, 2007 timeframe. It was a very basic API at the time. It had the ability to deal with resources like buckets and objects. Uh, very simple put, get, delete uh, style verbs, uh, but they were functional, right? And it started the process of everybody thinking about using object storage in mass. Uh, however, there was a problem, right? All of these were vendor specific. So that's when the uh, notion started of standardizing some of these API efforts. And there were, of course, two uh, that came about that uh, the industry started looking at. Uh, one of them was SNIA, the Storage Networking Industry Association, uh, came up with their own called CDMI. Uh, it is a REST dialect, so it has the concept of uh, doing key value storage. Uh, but of course, this was also the time that uh, people were uh, starting to talk about OpenStack, and uh, Rackspace was innovating with cloud files. 
which launched the SWIFT initiative. So this was around the 2010 timeframe. Uh, we do have to notice now, though, that uh, there is another big force, and that is that Amazon has invested a lot in S3 in the last few years. And while it's not a standard API because it's vendor specific, uh, it is kind of becoming a de facto uh, AP, uh, standard. And so what do we mean by de facto, right? What we mean is that there's a lot of usage for, from it, uh, both from ISVs and from application developers. And a large part of that seems to be driven by the fact that it just has a very, very rich uh, set of functionality, as you can see here. Okay, so it is a, a big growing factor. We do see a lot of specifically ISV, independent software vendors jumping on the S3 specification. Um, as an example, big vendors like Veritas with net backup. Uh, that traditionally wasn't a product that would use object storage on the back end, and now it does. Um, Commvault is another vendor. There are many, many of these. Uh, by some accounts, there are now 4,000 ISV applications embracing the S3 API on the back end. Uh, we've also seen the developer community really swell. Right? This is a big uh, revenue center for Amazon itself now. Uh, we ourselves saw it with uh, 20,000 attendees at the uh, reInvent conference. So I think we can now say that despite the fact that it's single vendor driven, uh, it's certainly emerging as a de facto uh, API specification. So what are the differences between Swift and S3? And if you start looking at it, I think the, the difference is becoming smaller, right? So Amazon is innovating. They're doing it very rapidly. Uh, they can do it fast because it's really themselves, right? They're sort of the ones that make their own decisions. Uh, but there's a lot of advanced functionality in Swift that now maps to S3. I think there's a few things that we want to look at kind of in a little bit more detail. And those are on the security side. Uh, Amazon does have a very rich model now for identity and access management, kind of the counterpart of what OpenStack does in Swift. Uh, but they do go a little bit further now with things like encryption. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, a lot of customers are also interested in managing their data over its life cycle. Right? So data is hot for some period of time after it's created, but over time it's less and less hot perhaps. Right? So how do we manage that life cycle? Okay? And then uh, uh, the third thing we do want to take a look at is a little bit about uh, things like versioning. How do they manage versioning in, uh, in S3? Okay? So let's start with kind of the, the security side. Uh, so I mentioned that um, Amazon is making innovations. They now have this no notion of identity and access management. Uh, there are three ways to manage access control. Uh, one is uh, the traditional kind of ACL model. So within uh, what S3 calls buckets, which is the analogy of Swift's containers, uh, there is the older style of doing access control lists, ACLs on buckets and objects. The newer paradigm is to actually create policies. Uh, you can put a policy on a user or on a group uh, and essentially uh, guard what that principal is able to access. So what resources uh, does, he, uh, uh, does he have access to and what type of access, whether it's full access or read-only. Uh, those are the kind of uh, policies that span services so they can go across storage and compute. Uh, however, there is the notion of just a policy on an S3 bucket, okay, which uh, gives me the ability to do very fine-grained uh, access control. Okay? Uh, on the further, furthermore, on the uh, security side, there is an object encryption specification now in S3. So this is something that we see a pretty big demand for, right? As people roll out cloud environments to deal with things like financial data or healthcare data, or perhaps in government where they have very specialized requirements, encrypting the payloads, the objects within the containers becomes very, very important. Uh, and usually the discussion becomes one of how do you want to encrypt? Do you want to use specialized drives like encrypted drives? or something in the hardware array? And the answer is very clearly no, right? They want this to be software uh, driven, something in uh, the software layer that's managing everything. Uh, Amazon has two ways of doing this, or one way of doing this now, but there, there seems to be another way emerging. Uh, the first is that there's an application API. Okay? They call it SSE, or server-side encryption. Uh, the idea is that on calls to store the data, put calls, and calls to retrieve the data, there are specialized headers that uh, instruct the application and the back end to actually do the encrypt and decrypt at the right time. So that's a good model because it gives me lots of control. It says I can encrypt certain objects and not encrypt others. Uh, on the other hand, it forces application level changes. So there is an in impact on the code. Uh, the one that a lot of the customers that we're talking to are also interested in is one that's more transparent. It says at the container level or at the bucket level, I'd like to just turn it on as a policy. Okay, so if I turn it on, all the objects that go in get encrypted. 
If I don't turn it on, that uh, object is not encrypted. Uh, this is not in either the S3 or the Swift spec today. Uh, it's something that could be implemented fairly straightforwardly and, in fact, could leverage the same model of key management uh, as the SSE API does, uh, which is that the customer really provides the encryption keys. Okay, and then uh, finally, uh, this concept of lifecycle management is certainly a very big topic that people seem to, uh, to really embrace. So application data clearly has different value over time, right? As I created, I need to access it quickly. It needs to be low latency. It needs to be fast. I want to have access to it really quickly. So that type of data may justify putting it on something rather expensive, right? A high-end array or maybe a flash uh, pool of storage. As it ages, I want to be able to think about putting on, on something that's more capacity optimized, something with bigger media, bigger disks, uh, something that uh, has the right economics to keep data on for a longer period of time. And then, of course, we have this growing notion of cold storage, right? Something that lives further away, it's slower to access, uh, but there's a huge economic advantage. Uh, it's certainly durable, but uh, maybe if I need to access it, the, the access times are a little bit longer. Uh, within the S3 API, there's now something called bucket lifecycle, which supports this kind of capability. It's essentially a way of saying this bucket and its objects within it, uh, I can apply policies to that deal with its lifecycle. For example, uh, put a date on the data and say uh, I'd like to expire it at that point in time, or I'd like to transition it. And the transition rule can be to move those objects from, from the original bucket to a target bucket, which may be in another on-premises storage, or it could be in a cloud environment somewhere that supports the, uh, the API. Okay, so very powerful capabilities, and we see the richness in the rules for this growing over time. Okay, so I think that, that's kind of the, in a nutshell, what we wanted to talk to you about is that S3 is certainly tracking as an advanced uh, set of functional uh, APIs for, for doing object storage. It does seem to be embra uh, being embraced by the ISV community, and it has lots of advanced features, and we certainly see the innovation not stopping. However, Swift is interoperable with the S3 API, uh, so to a large extent, applications can choose the right uh, choice, um, and certainly app OpenStack applications can leverage uh, S3 as a vehicle for storing object storage uh, over, over the long term and uh, at petabyte scale. Uh, so if this was of interest to you, please stop by and uh, come see us at Scality. We, we do support both Swift and S3 in our system, uh, which is the Scality ring. Uh, we're right down the row here in booth C9, and uh, as well as I'll stick around and take a few questions if anybody has some. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>